Hey guys, I'm going to talk to you about how to use the Gibson assembly method to design mutants in bacteria. So if you don't know about Gibson assembly already, the basic idea is that you're able to take multiple building blocks of DNA and put stitch them together in a single step. And so you get a final strand like this. Gibson assembly requires a few ingredients. One, exonuclease. Ligase. Polymerase. and nucleotides. And this is of course in addition to your building blocks, which presumably have already been designed. The exonuclease is an enzyme that will chew back at the five prime end towards the three prime end. So for example, if you have DNA that looks like this, the enzyme will chew in this direction and in this direction, so that you're left with a piece that looks kind of like this. And you have these ends, which can combine with another piece. If you have another piece with a piece with an end that has the reverse complement of this end right here, then through the Gibson assembly, the pieces can be put together. The ligase is used to stitch the backbone together. The backbone here is broken, and so the ligase will put it back together. The polymerase is what allows the DNA to be completely seamless. When we put these pieces together, sometimes there will be gap regions, and they need to be filled with nucleotides. And so, the polymerase will help fill the gaps. The reason why these gaps exist is because these exonucleases will start chewing back, but they don't really know when to stop. And so even though the overhang region that was designed into each piece is maybe 20 base pairs, the exonuclease may have cut 30 or 40, and I'm not exactly sure how much it will cut. And so in the end, you'll get a seamless piece of DNA that can be used to transform bacteria. So let's take the example of designing a mutant. We have this strand of DNA with a gene that I'll denote in blue that we'd like to delete. The reason for this is because we think that this gene is part of the process that allows bacteria to stick to a surface. And so our hypothesis is that if we remove it, the bacteria will no longer be able to stick to the surface. And so we'd like the strand to go from being like this to being a region in purple here. This purple region is resistance to some antibiotic. And this way, we'll be able to confirm that we've actually deleted the gene. In order to do this, we have to ask a few questions. One, how are we going to design primers? Two, how are we going to use them to build each block? Then, how are we going to assemble the blocks? And finally, how are we going to get this DNA into the bacteria? So I'll answer all these questions. Firstly, let's design the primers. To do this, we have to identify what our building blocks will be. Our building blocks will be roughly 400 base pairs upstream of the gene of interest, which we'll call up. The second building block will be the chloramphenicol sequence, 
which we will use a cassette as the template for. Um, this just means that we're not using the genome of the bacteria to get this piece because it doesn't inherently have it. And finally, we'll, use, we'll copy the down sequence, which will be roughly 400 base pairs downstream of the gene that we're interested in removing. In order to design each piece, we have to make primers. These primers are roughly 20 base pairs, and they have a melting temperature of greater than 60 degrees, roughly, if you can design it like that. So let's take the up sequence first. We will design a primer, a forward primer, on this side, and we will design a reverse primer on the other side. This reverse primer, however, will contain another sequence here that will allow us to overlap this entire piece with the, the resistance gene for chloramphenicol, canamycin, ampicillin, etc. We will do the same thing with the down sequence. So for example, our down sequence looks like this in the genome. We'll design a primer, a reverse primer on this side, and a forward primer on the other side, which contains an overlapping region for the resistance. And so, after we do this, and we design primers for our chloramphenicol piece, which will just be regular roughly 20 base pair sequences. We will PCR each with a template that will allow us to amplify these sequences. So in this case, the resistance cassette. In this case, it's the genome of the bacteria. And in this case, it's also the genome of the bacteria. So after doing this, we will put the pieces together using the Gibson assembly, which I've already explained. So our final piece will look something like this. The final question that we've proposed is how will we get this into the bacteria? So all we'll do is put a spot of this DNA on a plate, and then we'll coat the plate with the bacteria. We'll let the bacteria grow, and then the next day, we'll take the bacteria from this spot and put it on another plate with the resistance, so with the antibiotic to which our bacteria has a resistance to. And so only the bacteria that have taken up this piece of DNA and switched out the other piece will grow. And then we can use these for our future experiments. To confirm that they're really what we think, we run a gel on, their, on PCRs of that region, and we send that sequence to a facility that will confirm that it is actually the sequence we wanted, and that's it.